Ever since somebody had a goat and somebody else had some berries, humans have been trying to figure out what's a good way to exchange something that we have for something else that we want. So this is an age-old thing that goes back a long way. And it's not just humans. So one of my uh, colleagues and friends when I was uh, in economics graduate school, one of the things he did, he was interested in how money works in general. So he got a bunch of capuchin monkeys and introduced money into monkey society to see what would happen. Okay, and so the first thing that happened when you introduced money into monkey society was they used it to pay for sex. Okay, so prostitution was the most basic need in monkey society. So whether it's trading goats for berries or figuring out how to uh, make other transactions, we, for a long, long time, it's a very basic, primal thing to try and figure out how we can trade something we have for something that we want. Okay, and it took our ancestors not very long to figure out that there are really big problems with barter. With coming along with my goat, I've got to find somebody who's got the berries that I want, we've got to be in the same place at the same time, we've got to have a good legal system for figuring out that we can do this spot contract, and we've got to then not only have this double coincidence of wants, once I get, get the berries, I might want to trade them for something else and I've got to find somebody else who wants my berries and I can trade it for something else. And cash or other mediums of exchange obviously help make that work pretty well. And so whether there's, there's this long debate about the history of whether barter ever existed and what came first, the nation state or money and things like that. But pretty soon people figured out that you know, silver and gold coins had their problems and that fiat currency was a good way to do things. The problem with that, of course, is that we need it to be stable and we need it to be storable. So anyone in Venezuela at the moment, or the two and a half odd million people that just fled from Venezuela to Peru, or anyone who was around in Weimar, Germany, would tell you that there are problems with cash. Still, it's pretty good, it's served us pretty well, it's definitely better than goats. But Anyone who came here this morning in an Uber or paid for a taxi with a tap card or bought a coffee on the way here with their Apple Watch or whatever it might be knows that digital currency, zeros and ones, are not only a real thing that's happening, but they're also, they also have a whole bunch of advantages over even cash, as convenient as that is. So whether you use a, a Miki card in Melbourne or an Opal card in Sydney, whether you pay your tolls electronically as you kind of have to do in most major cities these days, we do a lot more of our transactions, not with actual cash, but with, if you like, digital cash. And that's made for a lot of us, that's made our lives easier and more convenient. So I was in Beijing recently giving a talk and after I'd finished with my talk, I did a little bit of touristy stuff and outside the Forbidden City, I was really struck that outside the Forbidden City, kind of classic tourist trap, so you'd expect in a, in a country with a, a lot of homeless people and a lot of very poor people, you'd expect some people there begging for money with you know, American and Australian tourists walking around with a bunch of, a bunch of money and feeling bad about this. Uh, and there were, there were beggars there outside the Forbidden City, there were quite a lot of them. None of them took cash. So they all had a sign translated into English that said, we only take WeChat pay. Okay, so I thought to myself, okay, well, when it's the disabled beggars in Beijing who are being snooty about not taking cash, maybe there's a transition going on here. And so I dug into it a little bit further, and it turns out that $9 trillion of transactions in China every year, US dollars, $9 trillion, happen on WeChat Pay compared to $13 trillion that happen in cash. And it turns out WeChat Pay has relatively high transaction costs, is sort of only moderately convenient. So this isn't even a particularly good medium of digital exchange, and it basically rivals cash in China. Okay? So this is for sure happening. Uh, and the question is, can we go all the way, and can we go all the way in Australia to being completely cashless? So, as I said, it's, it's, it's happening in China, it's obviously happening in Australia. We have chip cards, we have Apple Pay, we have banks talking about producing their own competing versions of Apple Pay, we have Android Pay, and lots of different ways to pay for things. Something that hasn't received as much attention as I think it should have that launched uh, earlier this year is a thing called the New Payments Platform, which is a consortium of about 37 banks in Australia 
uh, essentially set up or brokered by the Reserve Bank of Australia to be able to facilitate peer-to-peer, -peer, essentially from a mobile phone number or an email address to another mobile phone number or email address, instantaneous, 24-7, almost free transactions of any amount from 10 cents to $10 million or higher. Okay, and, and this, you know, if you don't have your Apple Watch, you don't have your phone, you don't have your eToll, you don't have your chip card, is going to be something that's a very efficient way for people to pay for everything from a latte to uh, the plumber's bill to splitting a, um, splitting a bill in a restaurant, okay? And it's something that those of you who've traveled, say, to the United States, I lived there for about a decade, you know, Australia's way ahead of countries even like the United States when it comes to this kind of technology. So it's happening, and it's tempting to say, well, you know, about two-thirds of our transactions are likely to happen without cash fairly soon. Uh, that's, you know, that's sort of pretty far down the curve. But there are big benefits that we can get from going all the way, okay? And by going all the way, it's estimated that there's about $6 billion a year that the Australian Commonwealth Government misses out in tax revenue, in GST and income tax, from the black economy, from people dodging tax. And just like when the GST was brought in, there's always more money there than people like me go estimate when we do our little calculations. It always turns up that there's a lot more of this stuff going on. So there's a big amount of money on the table, and there's a lot of convenience to be had. At the same time, it's a pretty good way to get rid of the main lubricant of drug dealing and organized crime by getting rid of cash. So here's my plan. It's not a very sophisticated plan. It's not a very complicated plan, but I think it'll work. So it happens over three years. And in year one, we get rid of the $100 bill. So we announce the three-year plan, and in year one, it's pretty straightforward. We get rid of the $100 bill. It turns out that's 46% of the cash floating around in Australian society, except it's not really floating around that much. So I don't know about you, but the last time I saw a $100 bill was either at a casino or at a foreign exchange window at an airport. You don't see them getting sort of passed around every day. And there's a good reason for that, because these are being stored by people trying to avoid taxes or trying to avoid their activity being tracked. Not everyone but a whole bunch of it is going to those kinds of things. That's not gonna to hurt too many folks. The second year, we could take out the $50 bill as we keep telling people what's gonna happen. That's another 47% of the cash floating around in Australia. And again, that shouldn't inconvenience too many people. It'll inconvenience people cheating on their taxes, it'll inconvenience people dealing meth, but it won't inconvenience too, much, too many of the rest of us all that much. And so now that we've got rid of, after two years, 93% of the cash in Australia, in year three, we can mop up the small change. And that's kind of the hard part. And that means that there are going to be a bunch of people who are not so jazzed about what's going on. So I do every now and then, as I talk about this, go on talkback radio. Uh, not intentionally, I kind of got ambushed the first time. And, and it turns out that, you know, at 4.30 in an afternoon in Adelaide, the people who want to talk about uh, the problems with uh, with having a cashless society uh, are largely uh, old people. And, and, and they tell you that you're an egghead professor, which is kind of right, but you know, I don't appreciate it, but I, I can't deny it. You're an egghead professor who doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, and that they really, like getting, they really like getting cash out, or in fact, one person told me they've never used an ATM in their life, they only use a passbook. And it's very convenient, because you can get your money out of a bank whenever you want. And, and, and I said in my nicest possible way, sure, between like 9.30 and 4, uh, Monday to Friday, excluding bank and public holidays, right? Uh, and that's kind of right. It's convenient in a certain way. But there are obviously greater conveniences to being cashless. And we can help old people and we can help young people. And whether that's having a seniors card that's got a chip in it, whether that's about making sure that there are uh, you know, easy mobile device devices for people to use. I have a seven and 11 year old kid and kind of for my sins, I was treasurer of my kid's uh, school PNC committee for three years. Uh, and one of the things that we did was what a bunch of other schools in the area did, which was have our canteen go completely cashless and have our uniform shop go completely cashless. And it was easy to do. And kids you know, are the most adaptable people in the world. So they go and order online or their parents order online or they take in a card that has preloaded $10 on it 
And as a parent, I love it. I know that they're not spending, you know, I can see exactly who the, you know, how much popcorn they bought and what they did with it at every point in time. And kids have no expectation of privacy. They, they, live in a world, they live in the world of Facebook. They're like, yeah, of course my dad's like, you know, tracking my phone, you know, he's got a, you know, he wants to put a chip in my ear and I'm still thinking about whether that's okay. Um, so, so I think, you know, young people are much less worried about this stuff. Um, actually, my, my favorite call on Talkback Radio was someone who called in who said, yeah, you can't get rid of cash. Uh, okay, why can't you get rid of cash? And they said, because when I buy stuff in a sex shop, I can, my wife can't find out about that stuff. And I don't have a good answer for that one, okay? So we're going to break a few eggs. Uh, but on the whole, there are pretty big benefits and it's pretty easy to, to do. So there are always going to be people who say, what happens if there's a tsunami? And my kind of glib but kind of accurate response to that is, well, I don't know about you, but if there's a tsunami, I'm looking for high ground, not tap and go for a skim latte. Um, so there are problems, the banking system goes down as well, there are security concerns, those are all the same concerns we have right now. But there's a bunch of money on the table, there's probably $10 billion or more in benefits that can come from this, and it's a chance for Australia to lead. It's a chance for Australia to show the world how we can do something that uh, cracks down on tax cheats, cracks down on crime, makes us, you know, gives us all another 10 minutes per day while we're not standing behind someone in line counting out coins, paying for, paying for groceries or, or uh, a sandwich, and it's a way for us to uh, really embrace technology and move fully into the, the, the new century.